What's concerning is that if everyone starts celebrating that Joe Biden is doing such a great job, then they won't be paying attention when we start bombing Syria again or we start escalating mm -hmm. with China or we just keep going on without really addressing the health care issue in our in our country, which is, is an issue that it, it's there. It's not going away. It's only getting worse. I mean, I think the health insurance companies are going to keep squeezing people as much as they can until they until they can't get away with it anymore. But at this point, there's mm -hmm. there's already a significant part of the population that goes bankrupt because of medical bills. I mean, this mm -hmm. party's not going to address that. And us giving Joe Biden an A plus so far in the next hundred in, in, in the first hundred days in office, it's not gonna help that because we're not going to be talking about that. The conversation is going to shift. You are listening to the Brown Perspective. So hey, we have great news today. Woke up What's today, that? and it turns out that Joe Biden is progressive after all. El progresista. According, that's right, Uncle Joe. He's a, a liberal. That's what Pramila Yayapal and AOC are telling me because they're giving him an A+. Plus. I guess he's stopped mass deportations. He's gotten rid of the kids in cages. He's canceling student debt. And the list goes on. Is that what's happening? Did I miss something? Well, he's... He's getting uh, getting us out of Afghanistan. <laughs> he is proposing infrastructure. He's proposing paid family leave so people can take care of their families. He's promising big government investments in green technology. So yeah, so he's uh, and I, it's funny because I know Republicans are calling him on that. You know, he he ran on on being a centrist and bipartisan, but he's now doing all this uh, liberal liberal policies stuff do you think he's going to be able to deliver on those things and he's he's not just doing lip service no i don't think he is i mean i think from yesterday's speech you can kind of see the focus and determination on his on his in his speech and i think he was also you can also feel that he's comfortable right he's he's a person that at his age having had the experience that he has had in politics and in Washington, D.C., he was just co comfortable. And you can tell by how the tone of his speech. And also there was even a couple, uh, an inst a particular instance instance uh, where he stuttered in a, in a word, which happens to the best of us, right? Even if we speak perfectly all the time in both languages, it happens to us. And he stuttered, and instead of kind of being flustered, he kind of just excused himself, pronounced the word, and then continued with the speech. So it just seemed like he was really comfortable and I think determined to to um, to really execute on, on his agenda, or at least that's the way he he came across to me yesterday. Yeah, but these are also staged events, <laughs> right? Yes, but they, that stage matters. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, it's it, it is entertainment. It is, but that's what politics is to a large extent. Here's what raises the red flags for me: two main things, and. I don't want to be a spoiler because I know we're supposed to be happy that we don't have Trump and this is a lot better than <laughs> than than not Trump. But like, dude, come on. I wouldn't be as annoyed if if the progressives, uh, Pramila Yayapal and AOC wouldn't have come out and said, oh, we give him an A plus because he's doing exceptional. I'm like, really? Come on now. He's doing OK, right, for a conservative because because these, these days the Democrats are moderately conservative but okay so the two things that i that i that raised red flags for me first is he made a whole bunch of promises during that campaign trail and he he has control of the senate and the house with the tiebreaker in kamala harris and he didn't deliver on some of those promises like the public option in healthcare, no mention of that 15 minimum 15 dollar minimum yes he did he mentioned that, you know, healthcare should be a human right. Right. So he mentioned those things. Right. So, so he'll mention them uh, all day long. He'll keep mentioning them for the next three years. Doesn't mean he's going to do anything. They had a chance for the $15 minimum wage and they blamed Joe Manchin, the, the one guy that, that seems to derail all the plans of the Democrat. <laughs> well, anyway, mm -hmm. so, so th these are politicians. They're going to say what they think people want to hear. I have to, I'll wait till I see it to believe it. The second, the second thing that, that raised the flag for me is, is the somewhat of a passive tone that he was using when he was talking about these things. For example, he didn't sound to me like a president 
that has a Democratic House and a Senate due to the tiebreaker. <laughs> barely, barely has. A I know, but but he sounded more to me like he was talking to a divided Congress, and that he was asking them to put things on his desk. Yeah, he didn't, because it is. Right, but... To the extent it is. Come on. He could have... If he really meant to do all a lot of these things, he came out and said, now that the Democrats uh, are in control, now that we have this power, now that we have a mandate from the people, this is what we're going to do. He wasn't saying that. What he was saying was, these would be great things to do, and now I'm looking for you guys to come and, and, and put a bill in front of my desk. Well, that he's giving himself an out because then now the Congress is going to go and debate all these things. And then Joe, Joe Manchin is going to get in the way and not let the Democrats do a lot of these things. And, and regarding li- leaving Afghanistan, they're, they're just going to pull out the actual uh, military, the, those that are enlisted in the U.S. military, and they're going to leave private contractors there. It's just a way of categorizing. They're going to leave forces there. Yeah, they're not... <laughs> And, and by the way, if he wanted to pull out, he would he could have pulled out like in May instead of waiting all the way to September and September 11. What a questionable day to decide when you want to pull out. But I'm almost willing to make a bet with you that September 11 comes and they're going to find a reason why we can't pull out, at least not the way that he's mentioning it right now. They'll say, oh, well, we're going to we're going to draw down a few thousand troops. We're going to leave some in there and then special advisors, non-military and then all these private contractors. So anyway, this is just a lot of stuff for me to really to believe all the hype that that this guy is going to be able to deliver on all these things. I think and going back to the other initiatives that he mentioned yesterday, I think he's not, you know, giving him himself an out. I think he's giving himself an in. I think he needs to come across as a moderate, as somebody who's competent, moderate, but who's willing to leave room for negotiations with Republicans and moderate Democrats uh, in order to get things done, in order to somehow retain whatever Republicans voted for him and whatever moderate Democrats voted for him, and and also by paying lip service to it and saying those very liberal progressive ideas, I think you get the type of support from AOC and other liberals because he paid, he mentions them, he mentioned that, mentioned those things, and that makes it the focus of a lot of the political conversation because he's on the record saying those things. So in some ways, he's probably counting on bipartisan conversations not happening because I think he understands the the opposition, the Republicans, and then he's going to be, okay, we tried. Now we have to get it done because we do have a mandate and we have to get it done. So I think he just bought himself himself a little a little a few more weeks of negotiation but i think they're probably very clear on on when they need to start moving things um through the through the um budget reconciliation process that that they really want to get through before things get even more political next year as as we start thinking of 2022 there'll be a few things that he'll do that are going to be positive the infrastructure bill if, and also making the, the first two years of community college free, and also I, I believe uh, preschool as well, just providing more uh, credits for families to help them. So that's good. I'm, I'm not definitely not going to to say that I'm not glad that he's doing those things. He maybe there's a chance that they do something with comprehensive immigration reform, but I think that's like the extent of what I see. That he'll be able to do and and those are more like obama era initiatives that he wanted to pass as well he just he lost control so he couldn't do that but he learned the lesson right i think they learned the political lesson we don't have that much time so we got to do yeah we can too but think about like healthcare reform allowing the u.s government to negotiate drug prices things like that, that that make a significant impact on a lot of people think about also uh, our foreign policy. I mean, we mm-hmm. are an empire. Both Democrats and Republicans love wars. And I don't <laughs> see him. I mean, he's escalating he's, the rhetoric <laughs> against China, trying to make it. He's seem trying like, to bring us together against the external enemy, bro. That's just a way, uh, a way to disguise imperialist policies, uh, create an external enemy, and then give us a justification for being. I mean, he's, he literally said that we have to keep our fleets in the South China Sea to prevent escalation. 
Dude, I mean, only yeah. an empire would be able to spin something like that where we, we have our military right next outside of somebody's country and that's supposed to, like, de-escalate. <laughs> it's like having cops in your neighborhood. What could go wrong? <laughs> anyway, th there's there's a number of things that are just th things that, that I, w I would consider progressive positions and I don't really see any of those so uh, the, the part Pramila and, and AOC coming out and saying and giving him an A what that tells me is that they've either have been somebody sat them down and said look if you guys try to do this whole progressive thing and block us we're, we're, we're going to you're guaranteed to to lose your next re-election or so that's the what's the strategy that uh, Plato Plomo right so there's the Plato Plomo strategy <laughs> and the, the Plata would be like entice them to say, hey, look, if you behave, if you vote with us, if you try to get all of your progressive supporters to sign on to the idea that Joe Biden is doing a fabulous job and he's a progressive, then there's something in it for you. There's a future here for you. And AOC probably has aspirations to one day run for president at some point. So they probably already filled her head with all those ideas. They're probably going to betray her and let her down, by the way, if that's the case. But that's that's the one approach where that's the that's the plata. That's where you try to buy them out, and the plomo, which is just you threaten them. It's either it's either, so it's one or the other. Either hey, work with us and 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 good things will come your way, or don't work with us. Bad, but or bad things will happen. One of the two has worked on them because that's the only reason why they're giving him an A. Because when it comes to progressive policy things that we progressives want to see they're not even talking about some of the things that we would want interesting well first of all i think as a colombia as a colombian i need to acknowledge a very smooth reference to pablo escobar <laughs> using that that plata plomo reference yeah that's uh, what it is <laughs> which is is very true and i think uh it, and i and i think you're right that i think that's what's happened because i know that's there's been a conversation that the type of defection hasn't really happened on the progressive wing of the party. It's happened mostly with the moderates. Um, so I'm sure that shortly Joe Manchin and and Senator Sinema from, from Arizona are going to have conversations and mo maybe some of the other folks that are in the middle. Um, but yeah, so I think that they know that in order to get reelected, and chances are that they're really going to lose the House because it's really tough. I mean, history is against them as it relates to the, the party and power keeping they're, all three branches of government. So they're trying to yeah. pull an Elon Musk and make history here by keep trying to retain uh, retain all three and then maybe growing their 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 majority in the Senate. Yeah, I think there's extremely high likelihood that they're going to lose. You well, know, they lose gun bla blazings. It, what's interesting, what happened with these progressives is that instead of them pushing Joe Biden to the left once he got elected, uh, Joe Biden and the Democratic Party just pushed all these progressives to the right. So now they're all just, uh, they're, they've all signed on. That we, we just have the regular Democratic Party. And, and what's, what's concerning is that if everyone starts celebrating that Joe Biden is doing such a great job, then they won't be paying attention when we start bombing Syria again or we start escalating with China or we just keep going on without really addressing the healthcare issue in our in our country which is is an issue that it, it's there it's not going away it's only getting worse i mean i think the health insurance companies are going to keep squeezing people as much as they can until they until they can't get away with it anymore but at this point there's mm -hmm. there's already a significant part of the population that goes bankrupt because of medical bills i mean this party is not going to address that and us giving joe biden an a plus so far in the next hundred in in, in the first hundred days in office it's not going to help that because we're not going to be talking about that the conversation is going to shift to things like this with this article from cnn that says hits and misses from biden's speech to congress and the very first thing is the harris pelosi elbow bump that's her story right there you have for the first time in history, two women in the second and third place of, of level of government. Yeah, well, that that is historic, but I'm talking just about uh, 
Well, maybe that's what I mean that that we're just we're just focusing on symbolic things. I mm-hmm. mean, this is important. Yeah, sure. But if if both of these candidates are owned by corporations, then does it matter that they're two females? <laughs> I'm not trying to be a pessimist here, but just just looking at at the reality of it. I mean, yeah. Well, it's funny because they're not only two females, but two females from what some would argue the most progressive, one of the most progressive parts of the of the country, San Francisco, Oakland, where you have had so much so many of the things that we now take for granted have started from policies implemented in those cities. And then when you think about the Black Panther movement starting there and sort of there's a this liberal revolutionary um, aura that the Bay Area has. So in some ways is is uh, interesting that you say that because in some ways it is it does show sort of the the journey that a, a progressive politician has to take in order to get to a position of power and now that they have real power how are they going to be able to are they going to be able to really bring about those changes or are they going to either to your point just kind of enjoy the status quo and enjoy enjoy the fact that they got there and do and do other things and do whatever they can versus really pushing for what they believe in. Well, yeah, that, that's really the challenge that while they may have started out as progressives, by the time they get to a position of power like this, you can get in. You can't get into a position of power like this if you are a progressive. Mm-hmm. If you're an independent thinker, if you're out there to represent your your community, if you're out there to actually fight for something. Now, at this point, they these politicians respond to lobbying and and corporate well, interests. You need people, you need people, you need money, right? You need to expand your base of support. And by expanding your base of support, I think you have to moderate your stance. And then you also need financial support. Right. But, uh, but by the time you get to this position in power, th- there's so many people, so many powerful people that helped you get there that you, you have to tangle with them you have to give them back you forget about the the people your community because the network your network grew but you you now are in a network of a whole bunch of influential people that got you into power and they got you into power they're not stupid they got you there because they know that you are going to be able to give something back to them so and these are the same people that are going to help you get reelected. so yeah that that's that's the problem yeah, well, you get to a position where you, get, you can give something back to them, but you also give something back to your community and you advance in terms of representation, of making decisions, of making investments, of changing policies like that universal. really make a difference for your people. And yeah, maybe you have to give some to, to, to those folks that did have a role, did play a role in getting you to that position. So... And I think for me, as, a, as, as I think probably our listeners know by now, I'm definitely the more moderate <laughs> person in, in our conversation, in our group here. Uh, but I, I do have to say that you're absolutely right. I think that I've, what I've learned through this dialogue with you and these types of conversations is that you're absolutely right. Like, well, I've, I'm glad and feel very comfortable and I celebrate, you know, this important but very symbolic victories and also kind of enjoy the my natural tendency is you know can we just all get along but the fact is that while we're just getting along here domestically or trying to there's so many things happening in our country there's so many things happening in the world and and to your point when you talk about there are kids starving in Yemen right now because we're supporting that right so we're supporting the Saudis and 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 starving and using these types of like medieval tactics Mm -hmm. in order to win a a war. And we're supporting that. And and, 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 yeah, maybe we're not saying, oh yeah, this this is something I support, but by staying quiet and not paying attention and not holding Biden and the other politicians accountable, we are are, um, contributing to that. So I think it is is a wake up call. And I, I do hope that my fellow moderates out there do pay attention to those um, those things that are f- further away, but in some ways are even more important than w- that's happening of, of what's happening here domestically. Because in some ways, how we treat our our people externally 
and internationally is how we treat our the worst and the more and the not the worst the most vulnerable in our society so there's a consistency with that like if you're able to act the way you do with strangers you're going to also going to be able to do that the same way that with people in your own family or maybe it's the vice versa right the way that you treat people here domestically enables you and allows you to just treat people that that way ex externally or internationally yeah definitely and thank you for acknowledging that that maybe we need to step back a little bit and look at the whole at the big picture not just at, at things that make us feel good about these politicians or, or things that that are convenient to us here locally i think mm -hmm. ultimately you're absolutely right our indifference to a lot of the things that they do is what enables those things to to continue and like I said, with, with these two candidates, like, yeah, it's symbolic, it's important, but at the end of the day, I know that neither of these politicians here, Kamala or Nancy Pelosi, neither of them is going to push for universal health care. Neither of them is going to stand up to the military industrial complex because they can't, because it's one big network and they're all in it together. They, they reciprocate. You help me. I help you. And so we have to keep pushing them. We just have to keep. Mm -hmm. And and that's why it's so unfortunate with, with AOC and Pramila Jayapal that if they're shifting to the right, then where's the progressive wing that's going to put pressure on them? I mean, we need that. We need that constant pressure to look. If we get out of Afghanistan on September 11, I'll we'll do a special session and I'll and I'll acknowledge <laughs> that that Biden has done a great job and, and that I'm happy that he did it. But I'm already reading that they're going to leave thousands of private contractors there. So and, and that's problematic because in some ways, you know, in some ways I rather have and this is going to sound crude. And I know as somebody who maybe doesn't have a personal a personal connection. I mean, I know people that have been to Afghanistan that have fought in Afghanistan, but, you know, no one in my immediate family has done so. But it's still like in some ways, if I feel like if we're going to be in a place, I'd rather that it be the U.S. military, because even as as wrong as they may do things, they're still more accountable. They have yep. there's more more rules and regulations there's more protections that they're more the high, higher ideals that they strive for versus those uh, government contractors, because I know those those guys are mercenaries. Right. So. Yep. Uh, and, and, and again, they're just going to do what it is that they're going to do and then they're going to have immunity. Um, so in some ways that if it is private contractors who are going to be there, that's even more concerning because then that that sort of continues the threat of of a private um, private mercenary force, which I think is probably more more um, more concerning as I think most action movies yeah. nowadays continue to to remind us about yeah absolutely less accountability with those private mm -hmm. contractors because they try to bury everything and there's no visibility into how they operate how, how they do things and so and it's profit yeah it's for profit Pure profit and that but at the end of the day look we are still involved in a bigger struggle or at least the way that the the military side of our government runs things operates is that they still see this this big, big uh, looming battle, and it could be like a Cold War type of style. It doesn't have to be a hot war, but there's China and then there's Russia, and, and those mm -hmm. two countries are on the ascent, and there's no way we're getting out of Afghanistan. There's no way because strategically, we're right there. We're right there where we can counter. We can, we can, we can throw a wrench into their plans. China's Road and Belt Initiative well, I mean, a few ro a few roads could blow up or a few um, insurgencies could happen around there that would scare some of the countries around there from not allowing that project to continue. I mean, it's strategically, it's like, it's where you want to be if you see mm -hmm. if you see yourself in this ongoing conflict with these two other countries. So that's why I don't think we'll ever leave Afghanistan. They'll always find a, a, a reason for, for leaving us there. I mean, basically, the only way we're going to leave is if we, if we get kicked out. Yeah. So, but not our, not on our own volition. No, that's, yeah, that's a good point. And I think just to tie the, the point about connecting the international 
with domestic threat. I think the other thing that was memorable about the speech yesterday was that he did, you know, reference the insurrection, the January 6th injur- mm-hmm. insurrection. He called out the lies. And then he also talked about the danger of white supremacy. And I think mm-hmm. that as we are so focused on those two external partners, we often forget that, you know, we were on January 6th, we were close to the toppling of our democratic government and that the main driving force behind that is white supremacy and that that is truly uh, a threat to to our way of light and to our into our government yeah i don't think it posed a serious risk just because trump is really incompetent but <laughs> but um in four years Wait. if if we don't get our act together and a, a, and a competent trump comes into power then yeah then it, things can get a little crazy in, in that situation. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, all right, let's wrap this up. Thanks for for listening. If you all out there like our content, make sure to check us out. We are Brown Perspective. Nos vemos. Ciao.